Hello again all! Welcome back to the Knowledge Tower, where we investigate the science behind the Bionicle legend. In today's investigation, we take a closer look at the star around which the whole Bionicle storyline takes place, Solis Magna. When I started research for this investigation, I wanted to see if I could answer what seemed at first to be a very simple question. Could I determine what kind of star Solis Magna was? There are many different kinds of star out there in our universe after all. Was there a way of using the evidence from the Bionicle Canon to narrow down that large list to find the type of star Solis Magna was most likely to be? As you're about to see, this turned out to be a far more complex question to answer than it first appeared, and will actually take several videos to fully explore. But for this video, if we are going to attempt to determine exactly what kind of star Solis Magna is most likely to be, then we first need to clear up one key question with how it is depicted in canon. Is Solis Magna one star, or is it two? This may seem like an easy question to answer. However, Bionicle Media actually has several contradictions regarding this point. In the novels set on the surfaces of Aquamagna and Baromagna, Solus Magna is only ever referred to using the singular word of Sun, suggesting that there is only one present in the sky. However, several visual depictions of the skies seen from these two bodies actually contradict this. Images such as these taken from The Legend Reborn and The Legend of Matanui clearly show two suns in the sky, suggesting that Solus Magna is not a single star system like our own sun, but is in fact a binary star system consisting of two stars gravitationally bound to one another the Spherus Magna orbits around. Now, this is most likely a simple artistic difference to be written off as one of the many instances in which visual media took a different approach to the books, but it did get me thinking. Is there any way in which both depictions could be considered correct? Is there a way that fits with the Bionicle canon, where there are two stars, but only one of which moves across the sky in a way that we would associate with a sun. Surprisingly, in order to answer this part of the puzzle, we actually need to take a closer look not at the stars themselves, but instead at Spherus Magna's orbit around them. So, for now, let's just assume that Solus Magna is a binary star system, consisting of two stars that are gravitationally bound to one another. In later videos in this series, we will get into the details of the characteristics and orbital mechanics of those stars, but for now, the fact that there are two of them is all the information that we need regarding the stars themselves. When it comes to the types of planetary orbits around binary star systems, planets fall into one of two categories. The first is a P-type or planet-type orbit, often also called a circumbinary-type orbit. This is where the planet orbits both stars simultaneously, with them orbiting each other at the centre, like this. In order for this type of orbit to be stable, the planet needs to be at least two to four times further away from its host stars than the separation between the stars themselves, and would likely have an orbital period of at least three to eight times the length of time that the binaries orbit each other. Tatooine from Star Wars is a good example in popular media of this type of planetary orbit, and it does have an advantage in terms of potential habitability. Because the host stars are close to each other and within the planet's orbit, there would be a smaller variation in the amount of solar radiation that reached the planet over the course of its year when compared to other orbital types, leading to a more stable climate. However, this type of orbit does not fit well with what we need for Spherus Magna. In a P-type orbit, the two stars would always appear to be close by to each other in the sky to an observer on the surface, with both rising and setting together each day, just like how we observe our singular sun to do here on Earth. If this was the case for Spherus Magna, it's very unlikely that the Magnans would only consider one of those stars to be a sun, and not the other. Therefore, we can discount this first type of orbit from our investigations. But what about the second type? A S-type, or satellite-type orbit, sometimes also called a non-circumbinary orbit, is where the planet orbits around only one of the two stars in the binary. Like this. Of these two types, it is the S-type orbits that have been observed more commonly in the real universe. For this type of orbit to be stable, 
the planet needs to orbit within one-fifth of the closest approach of the other star in the binary. Otherwise, the gravitational interactions of that second star would cause the planet's orbit to destabilise, potentially ejecting it from the system entirely. This type of orbit does involve a higher variation of the levels of incoming solar radiation that the planet receives, largely depending on how far away the other star is and how much that distance varies as the two stars complete their own orbits. This can lead to an unstable climate over time for the planet, making it a more hostile place for life to evolve. However, this difference can be reduced if the orbit of the stars have minimal variation in distance and if the other star is far enough away that its incoming solar radiation is negligible compared to that of the parent star. But we will leave a deeper dive into the implications of the star's orbit for a later video in this series. The main advantage for our current investigation of the S-type orbit is how it would affect the view of observers from the surface of Spherus Magna. In this next section, we will use some visual aids to demonstrate how the skies above Spherus Magna would change over the course of the year if it were in an S-type orbit. Let's call the star in the binary around which Spherus Magna orbits Solis A, and the other star in the binary Solis B. A simplified view of the system would look something like this. For the purposes of this demonstration, we are going to assume that the orbits of the two stars keeps them both in opposition to each other. Again, this will be something we will cover in more detail in a future video, but let's just go with it for now. We will start our year here, with Spherus Magna being on the left at the outermost edge of its orbit. To an observer on the ground, the sky would look very much like our own with Solus B being hidden behind Solus A, and Solus A moving across the sky each day, just like our sun. However, this familiar view would not last long. As time moved on and the orbits progressed, Solus B would begin to peek out from behind Solus A. By the time we reach a quarter of the way through the year, the view will look very different. By now, both stars are visible in the daytime sky, with both of them tracking across the sky as the day goes by. The movement of Solus A will be largely unchanged, with only the progression of the seasons affecting its path. However, each day the position of Solus B changes ever so slightly, with the gap between the two stars in the sky widening as each day passes. By the time we reach the halfway point of the year, the sky is radically different. Solus A is alone again in the daytime sky, following the same path as it always has. But now, Solus B has drifted so far from Solus A that it is illuminating the nighttime sky instead, lighting up the formerly dark skies with its glow. This is still dimmer than the daytime skies, however, as the sunlight is weaker due to Solus B's greater distance from the planet. As we transition into the third quarter of the year, Solus B has been catching up to Solus A and is again moving into the daytime sky only this time it appears on the opposite side of Solus A compared to with the start of the year. Then, by the year's end, Solus B is again hiding behind Solus A, ready for the cycle to begin anew with another year. As you can see with this demonstration, the apparent movement of Solus A and B are radically different over the course of the year from one another, but also, crucially, Solus A follows the behaviour that we as humans would recognise as that of a sun, whereas Solus B follows a different path entirely, one that humans don't really have a word for, given its alien nature compared to our own experiences of the sky. Like we do with the sun, the Magnans would likely associate Solus A with the passing of the days, with it regularly rising and setting as the days go by. Solus B, meanwhile, would likely take on a significance more with the passing of the years, given its yearly cycle across the sky. This, I think, is the key to the apparent discrepancy between the visual and written media when referring to Solus Magna. When the novels refer to the singular sun, they are referring specifically to Solus A, the only one in the binary pair that acts most like what the reader would consider to be a sun. Solus B is simply not referred to in the novels, as its yearly cycle does not affect the characters in their day-by-day -day actions as described in the books. Instead, it is left unmentioned, only to be shown in the visual media. Now, am I claiming here that this was always the case? That the story team always intended for there to be two stars, but 
intentionally chose to have this type of orbit so that they would only have to refer to one of them in the books? No, of course not. Like we said at the start, this is likely just a creative difference between the written visual media teams, something that is easy to do in a multimedia franchise like Bionicle. But for fans like us that love to explore these discrepancies, I think this is a really cool way to explain how this could work within the context of this fictional world, and it's a really fun way to add one more alien quality to this fantastical universe. If we wanted to, we could also take the direction of the orbit and the rotation of the planet into account to make the difference in the apparent movement of these two stars even more pronounced. In the visual example from before, we viewed the orbit of Spherus Magna from above the northern hemisphere looking down, with it moving around Solus A in an anti-clockwise direction. We also assumed that Spherus Magna rotated on its axis in the same direction, resulting in both stars moving from east to west in the sky in both of their cycles, just like the Sun does here on Earth. However, there is no reason to assume that they have to move in this direction. If both the orbit and the planetary rotation moved in a clockwise direction instead, the stars would appear to move from west to east, the opposite of what we are used to. There is actually some evidence of this being the case for Spherus Magna, with this concept art image from Christian Faber showing a clockwise direction to the planet's spin. In our own solar system, most of the planets spin on their axis in the same direction as their orbit. Venus, however, does the opposite, with the orbit being anti-clockwise, while its spin is clockwise. If this was the case for Spherus Magna, then the difference between the movements of Solus A and Solus B would be even more pronounced. Both would still rise and set in the same direction on a daily basis. However, over the course of the year, Solus B would drift away from Solus A in its yearly cycle in the opposite direction. As an example, if Spherus Magna rotated in an anti-clockwise direction, but it orbited Solus A in a clockwise direction, then the daily movements of the two stars would be east to west, but the yearly drift of Solus B would instead be west to east. This would leave the Magnans with a very strange sky indeed. Well, that's it for part one of this deep dive into the characteristics of Solus Magna. In this first part, we explored if Solus Magna was a binary star and how that would affect the view of the sky from Spherus Magna. In part two, we will take a closer look at the physical characteristics of Solus A itself, determining its mass, stellar type, and other characteristics. Then, in part three, we will bring Solus B back into the fold and explore how the gravitational interactions of the two would influence the system as a whole. Thanks again for joining me with this video, and I hope to see you again soon for another Bionicle Science investigation here at the Knowledge Tower.